With regards to whatever we've already taken, any questions? With anything we've taken so far? Yes. We are on the letter M, I think it is. M for moon fighting. Now, M is also for Majnoon. What's Majnoon? You know Leila and Majnoon? Now, what's Majnoon? Majnoon is the one who is insane. Do they have to fast? No, they don't have to fast. Good question. What about Zakah? We know the infant, the kid, the child, and the insane do not have to fast. Yes or no? The insane and the kid don't have to fast. Is there any fidya? Is there any kafara or anything like that due from them? No. Because the khitab, the obligation of fast, didn't even come upon them at all. Okay. What about zakah? Ibrahim has a son. And he's put in his son's account there 200,000 and he's kept this, you know, as a university fund, etc. So what about zakah upon Suleiman's money? Suleiman's 10 years old, but he's got 200,000. Suleiman's 5 years old, he's got 1,000, 10,000. He's got a million. Many kids, subhanAllah, sitting on nice massive estates. What about the Majnoon? What about the one who's insane? Maybe this businessman, you know, he's been 60, 70 years, he's been a millionaire. Now he's gone senile at the age of 18. His estate is 5 million. He's senile. Is there zakah on that estate? The question is, is there zakah upon the wealth, on the, those who are not balikh, the infants, kids, children? And is there zakah upon the wealth of the majnoon? What do you think? It's not hmm? it's not, yes. Why not? Why, why not? Because you said it's an act of worship. Act of worship, yes. And usually like act of worship, for example, salah, you have to be... I mean, salah, to say to the madman to pray is rather difficult. He can't... But, but what's the difficulty in asking for his wali or his guardian or whoever looks after his money to take out 2.5%? Isn't that easy? To ask him to fast, it's difficult. To ask a kid who's five years old to fast is difficult. But the father takes out from his one million and gives 2.5%. Is that difficult? No. So, what? Anything else? Jawad, what do you say? Make them pay. Ah, see, he attends at both of courses. Jaheed, listen. Zakah is an, is, an, is, is an act of ibadah, but it is not due upon the person. It's due upon the wealth. Because it's the haq of the poor, not on you, on your wealth. It's the right of the poor on your wealth. The poor man, all right, he's sitting there in the squatter camp or wherever, he needs some money. It makes no difference upon him whether you're an adult, whether you're sick, whether you whatever, whether it doesn't make a difference to him. He needs that money. So, according to majority of the scholars, zakah is due on the wealth and not upon the person. <coughs> so, the kid who's five years old and he's sitting with a million, the father should take out 2.5% and pay that zakah. Someone who's seen an insane man also needs to pay zakah. But him too? Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he said no. He said you don't have to. If you do, it's brilliant. It's all the better. But you don't have to. But rather, if someone asked me, someone came up to me personally and said, I got a son, he's got 500,000 in his bank account, should we pay zakah on that? I would say yes. I won't say you're doing a good thing. I'll say you must pay zakah. Why? Because zakah is an obligation upon the wealth and not upon the person. Jayid, hayyarakumullah. Any questions so far? Jayid? Um, one of the conditions for uh, for the zakat or money, to mm. speak, right? no. does that money have to be in your account for 12 months also? Ah, brilliant. Jayid. A was for annual, Jayid. and also H for the word hawl. Hawl is the cycle. Many a person thinks, I think I mentioned this maybe in a previous talk here. Many a person thinks, let me ask you the question. Suleiman has had one million in his bank account for one year. He calculates his zakat on the 10th of Ramadan. You all with me? You need to give me the answer. He calculates his zakat on the 10th of Ramadan every year. How much did he have in his bank account? One million. On the 5th of Ramadan, he did some business deal and he made another million in profit. So now on the 10th, how much does he have? He's got two million. He had one million for the whole year and he's got a second million now for how many days? Five days. On the 10th, when he's calculating his zakah, does he calculate zakah on 1 million or does he calculate zakah on 2 million? 100% huh? he calculates zakah on 2 million. Many a person thinks, no, but, but one year didn't go. But think on this. 
If you're using that type of mindset, thinking that there must be a one-year cycle on each piece of wealth, the person who owns a supermarket cash and carry, it would mean that he has to pay zakah every day of the year. Why? For last year's date. Today, what's the date today? 21st. Huh? 21st of? July. Of July. So technically he'll be paying zakat today for last year's 21st of July. Because that amount he put a, he put a tag there and that one there, it's got its one year cycle. Tomorrow he'll pay for the other one year. And tomorrow the other one, he'll be paying zakat every single day. Did you understand that? Mm -hmm. And a guy who's got sheep, so what does he do? Have the birth certificates for each sheep? Uh -huh. So for the whole year he's got 500 sheep, two days before his zakah date, you know, five of them gave birth, put a birth certificate there, when your cycle comes one year, then I'm going to pay zakat on you. No, 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 no. Uh, it's the one year cycle is to do with you being above nisab. That's what it's to do with. If you were floating above Nisab <coughs> for the whole year, and the Nisab is, uh, if you're working with silver, is what, maybe about 3,000. If you're working with gold, it's about 20 something thousand. And you had a million, so you were above Nisab for the whole year. Listen, the principle is, if you were above Nisab for the whole year, then you must pay zakah on your zakah date. And it's irrelevant when the money came into your possession. Even if it came on the day of your zakah payment. Two hours before your zakah payment, you had that money come into your bank account, you have to pay zakah on that. What about one year? The one year is to do with you being above Nisab. Otherwise, and I mean, I don't know how people pay zakah. Otherwise, people are supposed to be paying zakah every few days. Because when you got this amount of money, khalas, you did a deposit in your bank account, 50,000, put a date on it. And then you got 100,000, put a date on it. When that reach, reaches its one year, then you pay zakah on that. Okay? That's impossible. That's taklif, mala yutaq, which we wouldn't be able to, to take. Jayid? A question. One no. question. Oh. Uh, as you said on the Niswa, no. suppose you have mentioned about 3,000. Can you pay, first of all, a zakah on your salary? Imagine that a person is earning 3,000, and if that was a Niswa, and but that money is hand to mouth, is he allowed to pay or is he obliged to pay on that 3,000 as zakah? Jayid, so here's a person. We'll come to Z for zakah, inshallah. Jayid, someone earns 3,000 a month. He only has to pay zakah once a year. So, let's say it's the 10th of Ramadan, which is his zakah date. So when the 10th of Ramadan comes, he looks into his bank account, he looks under his bed, he looks into his cabinets. What money does he have? If he's got money, and if it's more than the Nisab, he pays zakat on it. If there's no money there, then there's no zakat. If it's 2,000, no zakat. So let's say, I mean, uh, I mean, my maid, I would think, that she's got some uh, you know, money kept aside for a cold day, money kept aside for a kid's university, etc. So she might be earning one and a half thousand, but she keeps aside some money every month, 300, 400 a month. Jayid. So she might have, let's say, 5,000, 6,000. She pays zakat on that. Can she take zakat? We'll leave you to think about that question. Maid earns 2,000 a month. End of the year, she's got six. She pays zakat on that. But she needs money. Can you survive on 2,000 a month? She's got three kids. Can anyone survive? Can't. So she needs money. Can you pay zakat on one side and also collect zakat? I'll leave you to think about that, inshallah. We'll continue after salah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi wa rahmatullahi wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuhi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. We continue, insha'Allah. I left you with the question before the uh, Salat al-Asr. Is it permissible for someone to pay zakah and also collect zakah at the same time, insha'Allah? Keep pondering over that question, insha'Allah. I will deal with it at the end. I just want to finish off N up to Z and then we take questions, insha'Allah. Jayyid. N. N is for what, Ya Abdullah, when it comes to the month of Ramadan. N is for the word what? The word niyyah. Niyyah, what is niyyah? What is intention? What's niyyah? What's niyyah? Niyyah is to know what you are doing. Niyyah is to know what you are doing. Do I have to, for example, uh, wake up in the morning and say, Oh Allah, I am going to fast. I am going to fast tomorrow uh, for your sake, etc. Allahumma inni nawaitu an asumu ghadan laka faghfir li ma qaddamtu wa ma akhartu ila akhirihi, etc. Uh, does one have to say all of this here? 
When you did your Ramadan shopping, one month before the month of Ramadan, why did you do that shopping? Doctor? Why did people do that shopping? They did the shopping, why? Because they know they're going too fast in the month of Ramadan. When you told all your cousins and uncles and 50 people to phone you at the time of Suhoor, why did they phone you? Why did you tell them to give you a misquad? Why? Because? Because you're waking up too fast. So, at the time of Suhoor, after you eat, if someone asked you, what are you doing right now? What would you say? I'm eating Suhoor. Why? Because I'm going too fast. So as long as you know what you, what's happening in your heart, as long as you are conscious of what you are doing, you don't have to say on your tongue that, Oh Allah, I am now going too fast today for your sake, etc. There's no need to say that. Did you get that? For example, someone stands on the Musalla before Salatul Fajr or Salatul Asr or any prayer. Do they have to say, Oh Allah, now I'm praying for rakahs for your sake, I'm praying Salatul Asr, and I'm praying behind the Imam, and I'm following the Imam, Ibtiday to Bihar. Do you have to say all of this? No, you don't, Jayid. As long as you know what you're doing. If someone asked you, What are you doing? What would you say? I'm praying Asr. How many rakahs? Four. I know what I'm doing. Khalas, that's your intention. Ibn Umar, son of Umar, he saw a man saying, Oh Allah, I'm making Hajj for your sake, etc., loudly. So he asked the man, who are you telling? Are you informing Allah? So he says, no, I'm not informing Allah. Are you informing yourself? He says, no, I'm not informing myself. He said, then keep quiet. What's the point? There's no point. As a scholar, he said, verbalizing of the intent. You're supposed to have intention in your heart. That's there. I mean, come on. Many a times you know that you made a mistake, you came for Asr because you learnt in Madrasa, four rakahs di dada. So you said, oh Allah, I'm praying four rakahs of Zohar. But it was Asr. After Salah, you went to Mulana, you say, Mulana, you know what, I made a big mushkila, Dalmal, what, Parishan, whatever. Uh, what do I do? He says, no, I said on my tongue, I'm praying Asr, but I knew in my heart it's Zohar. So the Mulana would say to you, what you had in your heart supersedes. That counts at the end of the day, yes or no? That's what he'll tell you. So then what's the point of even verbalizing in the first place if what's in your heart takes preference in all matters? As a scholar, he said, the one who verbalizes the intention on the tongue before wudu, before ghusl, before salah, before fasting, before hajj, etc. This person has a deficiency in their aql and a deficiency in their religion. Deficiency in their aql, why? I know we all learned this in madrasa. In my madrasa, the hardest thing during exam was they would test you. So four akas of Zohar. And you must learn it in Urdu also. They made our lives a living hell a long time. And you must know it in Urdu and four akas too. And then they try to trick you. Tell us the intention of five rakas of Maghrib. They caught us a long time. So, uh, the scholar, he says, deficiency in their aql because who from amongst you, before they eat, they say, oh Allah, now I'm going to eat food. Anyone does that? The clock? Where are you from, Shaykh? Uganda, before you eat food, you say, Oh Allah, now I'm eating, I'm eating biryani. You do that. Do you do that? Oh Allah, I'm eating biryani. I know they say Bismillah. Bismillah is dua. We mix up in South Africa, we mix up between intention and dua. Intention and dua are two different things. Dua is dua, supplication to Allah. You know if anyone say, Oh Allah, now I'm eating food. Oh Allah, now I'm starting my car. You saw anyone doing that? Oh Allah, now I'm walking to work. Oh Allah, now I'm going to school. Anyone does that? Nobody. So the scholar said, if you don't do that for the rest of your life, why suddenly when it's time for wudu, you have the urge to like, you know, verbalize something? Why when it comes to salah, suddenly you want to inform somebody or you want to say something on your tongue? You don't do it for driving the car. You don't do it for eating. You don't do it for everything else. And so the same rule applies. Also, uh, he states, you have a deficiency in your deen because the Prophet ﷺ, before he started salah, he didn't say any of this. Oh Allah, I'm this, I'm that, for Allah. He never did this. First thing he said for his salah was what? Allahu Akbar. Sahaba also didn't know about this. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah didn't teach us this. Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal didn't know about this. This many, many, many years later, you know, someone was writing Madrasa syllabus. He said, now these kids are playing around here, making so much of noise. Let's give them something to keep them busy with. What? Let's make intention here for Zohar, Asr, Sunnah, Nafil. And they made that day, it got stuck with the Madrasa syllabus, and we all had to learn that. And you know, sometimes it even causes problems. You saw a brother, he comes in the masjid late, Imam is in Ruku, and now he's got viswas of shaitan, whispers of shaitan. He comes, Allah, Imam is in Ruku now. 
Allah, Allah Akbar. No, I didn't miss out something. Imam Sami Allah, he said Allah Akbar again. Allah, Imam is in Sajda. Allah Akbar. Four, I missed four rakahs. Allah Akbar. Subhanallah. Imam is in second rakah and he's still trying to get his intention thing sorted out. Yes or no? This person, he should not. As long as he knows what he's doing, what are you doing, brother? When you left your workplace, if someone asked you, where are you going? I'm going for Juma. Khalas, you know what you're doing in the story. Nothing to verbalize. By him, though? So similarly with fasting, as long as you know what you are doing, there's no need to verbalize because you find people ask the question. They say, Mufti Sahib, you know what? Fast starts, example, 5 o'clock. At 10 to 5, I made my intention. At 5 to 2, can I eat? Yes, you can eat, no problem. Because intention on fast only starts at 5 o'clock. By him, though? In that example. Jayin. N is also for Nisab. What is Nisab? Nisab is the minimum threshold of wealth that you need to have for zakah to be an obligation upon you. If you got five rands, there's no zakah and obligation upon you. You got 20 rands, no zakah. What's the Nisab of gold? 85 grams. What's the Nisab of silver? 595 grams. Jayin. Uh, if maybe you can go slightly back. Uh, yeah, if slightly back, so it doesn't. Uh, 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 yeah. So uh, 595 grams of silver and 85 grams of of gold. So that's for gold and that's for silver. What about our rands? What about our dollars? What about our francs? What nisab do we use? If you work out 85 grams of gold, you'll get an amount. It's about 20 something thousand. If you work out 595 grams of silver, it comes to about 3,000 something. So usually in South Africa, what they've been using, the Jamiat, etc. When you ask them what's Nisab, we don't have a Nisab. Did the Prophet ﷺ tell us Nisab of dollars is such and such? Did he tell us that? Did he give us a threshold for dollars? You got some doubt here, Mashaykh? Say no then, Jayid. Uh, did he give us a threshold for rents? No. He's only given us the threshold for gold and silver. Now we work it out in rands, but now we got two nisabs, yes or no? One's a very high nisab, 23,000 or 25,000, and one's a nisab of like 3,000. Which nisab would we use? Which nisab would we apply on our rands and dollars and francs, etc.? Massive uh, ramification this mas'ala would have. If you take 25, that means anybody who's got less than that 25, no zakah upon them. If you say that we use for dollars the nisab of silver, then it's 3,000 and there's more people paying zakah. You got that? Majority of the scholars go with, and in South Africa, they go with silver. That, right, they go with silver, which is about 3,500, I think the nisab is. You can, if you just do one Google search, look at the, today's current price of one gram of silver. When you get that one gram of silver, times it by 595, you have the nisab of silver. Work out one gram of gold, times it by 85, you have the nisab of gold. So majority of the scholars, and all South African scholars, they go with the nisab of silver for currencies. So that's why on the website they say nisab, they say, well, if you got more than 3,500, etc., or 3,000, you need to pay zakah. Jayid? And that's what many scholars states. I personally, you can go with that. Brilliant. And the, uh, the benefit of that is what? More people pay zakah. That's why they do that. They say at least the, pre, the poor benefit. More people pay zakah. The poor benefit. Alhamdulillah. So if you have a maid, etc. And she's kept aside some money, uh, 5,000, etc. She needs to pay zakah on that because it's more than three. But if we worked with the gold amount, then she wouldn't be paying. You got that? I personally... You're not bound to follow that in the least bit, Jayid. I go with the opinion of Sheikh Yusuf Al-Qadawi, Sheikh Yusuf Al-Shubayli, etc., which is the opinion of using gold, or the higher of the two values. Maybe silver one day would go higher, but the higher of the two values, why? Because technically, the one who's got 3,000 or 4,000, you don't call them rich. They're in need of help in reality. So zakah is taking from the rich and giving to the poor, and this person who's got like three, etc., or four, they're not... In that, I mean, the, the whole idea of zakah is taking from the rich and giving to the poor. And taking from somebody who's got three or four doesn't really judge with that. In, and well, people might say, well, 25 is also not a lot. Huh? But the point is, we only got two options. We only got two options. Right? So it makes more sense to take. Also, there's no obligation upon you until we are certain that something is an obligation upon you. You are free from obligations. What's the name, Sheikh? 
Shu'aib is free from anything being followed upon him. We can't, it's, it's a bit uh, tough for a mufti to say to him, Shu'aib, you got 5,000, zakat is an obligation upon you. I'm obliging something upon him, I'm making something followed upon him, and my proofs are not that certain. If he reaches 25, then I'm certain that zakat is due on him. Maybe with Allah, the Nisab amount for currency is the gold, and we obliged it upon him, and he was not obliged upon, it was not an obligation upon him. Right? But as an individual, what's the safer thing for you to do? As an individual, from a fatwa side, it's safer for the mufti to say use gold amount. Because he can't make something an obligation upon you until he's certain. Uh, from an individual point, what's the safer thing? To work with the silver amount because you paid it, alhamdulillah. So that's the nisab. We take a question. Uh, N is also for nikah. Jayid. What is nikah? I mean, technically, the word nakaha means what? Nakaha means the act of uh, intimacy between husband and wife. Uh, nikah in the month of Ramadan. Is that allowed? Yes. Are you allowed to get married in Ramadan? In Malawi, they get married in Ramadan, sir. Yeah? Especially before the Ramadan comes. No, before different story. <laughs> right? But in Ramadan, are you allowed to get married in Ramadan? People get married in Malawi in Ramadan. Yeah. Yeah. Don't have to invite people for Walima. Huh? <laughs> so invite them for after. lunch. Huh? Invite them for lunch. After, after Juma, we're having Walima, the whole masjid is invited. Huh? Allah <laughs> must die. Jayid, by the way, all your brothers are invited to my place tomorrow for lunch. Jayid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you invite yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You know, I'll make it here in Johannesburg. Anyway, wherever it might be. Jayid, Prophet ﷺ got married in, in the month of Ramadan. He married Zainab, radiallahu ta'ala anha, in the month of Ramadan. Also, We'll deal with that when we come to our inshallah. The month of Ramadan, as we know it, the way we fast is a very easy way. In the early days, it was very different. We'll learn about that in the letter R, inshallah. Uh, also, K was for, uh, K was for what? K was for? Kind. Paying your zakat in kind. K is also for kiss. <coughs> is it allowed for husband to kiss the wife uh, when they're fasting? Yes. Prophet ﷺ was approached by Umar. Umar said, I destroyed myself. What did he do? Oh, Umar, kiss my wife. Prophet ﷺ said, don't you see, if you gargled your mouth, would there be any problem? He says, no. So similarly, kissing the wife, etc., just like gargling your mouth, no problem, inshallah. There is a weak hadith in the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, which states that a young man came and asked the Prophet ﷺ, am I allowed to kiss my wife in Ramadan? He says, no. Old man came and said, can I kiss my wife in Ramadan? Prophet said, no problem, no problem. Uh, this hadith has weakness in it. Uh, but the meaning of the hadith makes sense. They said, well, you see, because the old man now, you know, he, he can kiss and kiss. Mafi mushkila, mafi mushkila. You don't really expect him to fall into the major haram. You got that? Whereas the youngster now, he's 23, 24, mushkila, right? Mushkila, problem. But the hadith has weakness. And we can counter this hadith how? Ask those brothers from Pakistan, they'll tell you how many an old man is a young man and how many a young man is an old man. Huh? He might be old but not cold. So the point is, uh, there's no general rule like that. Prophet uh, the Sahabi came and asked the wives, you know, is it true Prophet some used to kiss his wives in Ramadan? And then one of them giggled. Uh, and then you know, he asked, uh, was it you? And then she giggled. Aisha anha. What was her age when the Prophet passed away? She was 18. She was 18, so he was kissing her. She was young. So we can't really say it's, a not, it's not allowed for the young and it's allowed for the old. She was young and Prophet would kiss her. No issue. As long as one can control themselves. Fahim to? As long as you can control yourself, inshallah. In fact, we don't go down that route. Ibn Hazm. Anyone knows Ibn Hazm? Anyone heard of Ibn Hazm? Yeah, Mashai. The first revelation was what? was Iqra. I know in this month here we say to you, read the Qur'an. But otherwise, generally read, Ya Mashayikh. Read books, read books, and read books. We are an illiterate nation in reality these days. I wait for the movie to come out. Many of the Islamic books, no movie is going to come out. <laughs> Even IT, we're not going to turn into a movie. Someone said, we don't watch more movies now, now we watch more movies. Huh? Ya Mashayikh, read, subhanAllah, read. Allah What are we talking about? Ibn Hazm, subhanAllah. Uh, scholar from where? Andalusia. Scholar from Andalusia. Where's Andalusia? Spain. Spain. You know, we talk about uh, you know the glory days of Islam, etc. I mean, Islam, we ruled over Spain for over 500 years. And more than that, and this one saddens me more, 
that, uh, and especially because our traditional scholarship have been people who studied in the Indo Pak, and uh, that's our, you know, besides obviously the Malawian brothers, etc., but uh, you know, the Indians, Molanas, etc., studied in that area, Indo Pak, and uh, our families, etc., came from there, relatives, and all of these things. But we don't know anything about the, what, the Mughal dynasty. We don't know anything about Aurangzeb. We don't know anything about all of those people because Islam ruled India for about 800 years. So for, everyone knows Spain, you know, which fell. But what about India, subhanAllah? You go to the Red Fort, you go to those places, dogs running around, idols everywhere. I mean, in Mumbai and many places, Muslims feel like, you know, you're an outsider. I mean, how sad it is that in how many a village that the Muslim is looked down upon, he's treated like trash by the cow worshippers. Allah Muslim, that's the reality today. Huh? And you know, you go to Delhi, they have this uh, light show or something at this, uh, is it the Red Fort, I'm not sure where, where they, you know, they have this like whole, uh, like a play type of thing. Uh, you just hear the voices of how the whole dynasty fell. Allah Muslim, very, very sad. Read about the history. Last week I read this book, The History of the Islamic Resurgent Movements in the Indian subcontinent, 500 pages something, by Habibul Haq Nadvi. He was a scholar who was uh, from Nadwatul Ulama, based in Lucknow, and eventually came to South Africa. He was in Durban, he wrote the book in Durban, passed away a few years now. Fantastic whole history of the whole Brelvi movement, and then the Durban movement, Shawal Yula, Dehlawi, the Ahl al Hadith, the Jihad movement, uh, Shah Ismail, Shaheed, etc. Brilliant, the Qadianis. So it puts everything in context, you know, where they were coming from, how they were coming, what were they coming from. Brilliant, read, Yama Shaykh, read, read, read. Jayid, where are we, Yama Shaykh? So that was Nika N4, Nika O4, old age. So the person who is very, very old can't fast. What do they do? You know the answer now. They feed a poor Muslim for every day that they did not fast. Uh, P is for? P is for the poor. We give them our zakat. Jayin. And there's eight categories of people we are allowed to give zakat to. Who are they? Surah Toba, verse number 60. Who are the eight categories? إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءُ Verily this sadaqat, sadaqat here means the zakah. It's for the fuqara, fuqara, the faqir, the person who has nothing and he has no means to get anything. He is downtrodden, he's got nothing. Doesn't have a skill to earn, you know, or his skill is, uh, doesn't really have any relevance in the place where he is. He's got nothing and no means to earn anything. Fuqara, wal masakin. Miskin is a person who maybe is working. He's got a skill, he's got a job, but it's not enough. He's miskin. Jayid. So for example, you have a maid, etc. Even if you're paying her maybe 2,500, uh, but she's got three kids, uh, she needs to send them to school. 2,500, is that enough for her? No, it's not enough for her. Jayid. You might tell me that a brother, you know a cousin, he's working here in Johannesburg, he's earning 7,000, but every month he's in debts for like 4,000. Because seven, he can't survive, yes or no? <coughs> huh? So this person falls in the category of, of miskin. Can that person take zakah? Yes, he can take zakah. He earns seven a month. He's got five kids. He's got a wife. She's ill. Uh, and he has to see to the expenses, house, etc. Five kids. Can he survive on seven in Johannesburg? I ask you, can he survive on seven? What, let's say he needs 12. So he's got seven and he needs 12 a month. We can give him, if I'm talking about in a case where we got more than enough of zakat, we got billions of zakat, so we can give everyone alhamdulillah. So, so what do we do? He comes every month, he's got his expenses, it's proven, etc. He earns seven, he needs a five more, we give him five more from zakat. So yet, because he's miskin. إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَى وَالْمَسَّاكِينَ وَالْعَامِلِينَ And the people who work. So the Khalifa, not uh, Tom, Dick and Harry, or Suleiman, Iqbal and Ilyas, the Khalifa, he appoints these people to go out and collect zakah from the outlying areas, from everyone. They work in the uh, ministry of zakah. Like Saudi Arabia, other countries, you have the ministry of zakah. So they get paid a salary from the money which is collected. So they are given a portion. But we don't say Shu'aib. Shu'aib says in Johannesburg, Portsburg, ah, oh, subhanAllah. So me, what I'm going to do now? I'm going to collect zakat from everybody and I'm going to make my own check because then everybody will become zakah collectors. We all give our jobs up and we all become zakat collectors. We write our own checks. That's not allowed. Do you get? And you have many cases of abuse like that. Those who want to soften their hearts. 
Prophet sallallahu you had certain individuals, tribal leaders, not Muslims, tribal leaders, not Muslims, Prophet sallallahu would give them from zakat. Huh? Because the tribal leader, if his heart becomes soft, he embraces Islam, his whole tribe will embrace Islam. Also, they won't harbor enmity against us, they won't harm us and trouble us, etc. Because money has a way to the heart, whether you like it or not. Prophet ﷺ would give them, even though they might not be Muslim, and also people who be embrace Islam and their hearts are here, there, and everywhere. So we give them. I mean, we're talking about in a case where we have more than enough. But if you've got somebody who's dying out or dying of starvation, and you had somebody who's, uh, you know, he's got his Edgar's account which needs pain, who do you give the zakat to? Obviously, the one there, you know, who's in dire straits. So. And the slaves, they want to earn their freedom, they want to be free, so we pay off and we uh, give the master some money, so he sets free and we purchase the slave and we set him free. Contemporary example, we might have brothers who might be in jail, jail and his brother is now incarcerated and uh, Muslim prisoner of war or whatever the case might be and he needs a hundred thousand for him to earn his freedom, from here we can pay from the zakah and get his freedom. Well, mean and the people who are in debts, Jayid. And in reality, this category today is one of the most prominent categories. Because who's poor and who's fakir, we don't really know. But can, it's easy to establish whether a person's in debt or not. Person comes there to you, you know, with his hospital account. But you phone up the hospital, you know, he's owed <coughs> this money. So you can pay that off easily. Person comes, school fees, this is what we owe, etc. It's easy to ascertain and make sure the person is truthful when it comes to matters of debt. Someone says, I'm poor. We don't really know. But he's got debt, it's easy to ascertain. Make sense? So those who are in debt, uh, they also can be given off zakah. Uh, to pay off their debts, Jayid. Will Ghari mean, Wafi Sabirillah, and in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who, the Mujahideen, our brothers and sisters fighting in Syria, brothers and sisters in dire straits, etc. The Mujahideen, he needs to buy Klashnikovs, etc. He needs to buy arms, tanks. We, pay, we give them from zakat, no issue. That's a category there clearly in the Quran. We give them from zakat. Even if they're rich, even if the man's a millionaire, and he wants to buy an AK-47, he says, no, I don't use my money, you give me from zakat, we give him from zakat. Why? Because that category, fi sabilillah mujahid, he has that share there, jayid. Wabdi sabil and the way also fi sabilillah uh, is uh, many contemporary scholars, especially for those in the West, the, the jihad, what's the aim and objective of jihad? Huh? To establish the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, to establish the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jihad is one means. And da'wah is another means also to the same end. Yes or no? In fact, da'wah is before the jihad. First we give da'wah not accepted, then we move on to the other category of jihad. Yes or no? So if we are able to do the jihad of da'wah without the sword, then zakah can be used in that category too. So, those, let's say there's a brother who's involved in da'wah work, etc. Uh, he wants to print some books. He wants to open up a satellite station, you know, for uh, doing da'wah programs and stuff like this. Can they use zakah funds? Yes, they can. Jayid, from that category. Is it best that they use zakah? No, it's best they use other funds. But can they use? Yes, they can. Jayid. Uh, Wabni Sabir and the wayfarer. Someone might be a millionaire in his country. He's left Somalia. He's a millionaire. But subhanAllah, the bank has been frozen. He can't get access to his funds. He is now in South Africa here. He's a billionaire in Somalia. He says, I need to you can help me out with some zakah money here so I can get back to Somalia. So we help him out until he gets back to Somalia, inshaAllah. Wabn Sabir, the wayfarer. Jayin. So those are the categories that we are allowed to give zakah to. One of those categories was the poor. Female who's pregnant, we already discussed, she does not have to fast. What if she says, I can manage to fast? She said, I, I, I don't fear for my own health. I don't fear for the health of the kid. I'm only three months pregnant, but I don't want to fast. I can manage, but I don't want to fast. Does she have to fast? No, she doesn't. As long as you're pregnant, even if you're one month pregnant, you don't have to fast. What does she do? Temporary excuse, make it up after the month of Ramadan. Q for Qadha. We make up Qadha after the month of Ramadan. Jayid. Uh, Q is also for Quran. This was the month wherein the Quran was revealed. Ya Abdullah, Ya Abdullah, Jayid. And how sad it is. How many of you speak Arabic? How many of you know Arabic? Mafi, the floor? Ugandi, Mafi Arabic? Shwe Shwe? Mafi? 
Allah must die. Total? Malawi. Bas, Malawi. Right? The language of the Quran, we don't know the language of the Quran. I mean, technically, I know we overdo it sometimes. You know, we overdo it, the stress on the hat. We overdo it sometimes, the stress on the clothing, the miswak, etc. If you want to put things on, and not belittling that in any way, but if you want to put things on a scale, learning the Arabic language, the language of the Quran, is a million miles ahead of importance, then those other matters there. You got that? SubhanAllah. The language, the kalam of Allah, subhanAllah, this is the iPad, right? But the kalam of Allah, subhanAllah, it's what Quran is, right? The kalam of Allah, subhanAllah, the message Allah has sent to each one of us, that day we don't feel important. The language the Prophet Sallallahu spoke morning, evening and night, that not important. Allah must die. That's sad. Uh, in the Quran, Allah states, don't come for salah when you are drunk. Why? Because you don't know what you're saying. Told the Arabs, the Sahaba, don't come for salah when you're drunk because you don't know what you're saying. I ask you, a companion, Abu Huraira, Umar, anyone, if they were drunk and they performed salah, they recited Surah Fatiha, what percentage do you think that they would have understood? SubhanAllah, earlier on when I was talking, I was indicating to you to bring me a glass of water. Only now I realize I'm fasting. <laughs> Lucky you didn't bring the water. Now, check it. Uh, what percentage do you think they would have understood? I think maybe about 50%. The man is reading Surah Fatiha every single day. He's now drunk and he reads it. I think he'll understand 50-60%. Yes or no? Yes. We are not drunk. We are sane. Huh? We performed salah, Allahu Akbar, wala dhalin, ameen, we understood 0%. And they were told, don't come for salah, stay away from salah because you don't understand enough. 50% is not enough. Don't come for salah. SubhanAllah, imagine us, we're supposed to be running away from our salah. You got that? The important, that verse shows us the importance of the Arabic language. That the Sahaba were told, you drunk, you don't understand everything you say, don't make salah now. When you're sober, then you make salah. We are totally sober. Allahu Akbar, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah, we understood the search. Sad, very sad, very sad. Jayid. R, R is for? R is for the rate that we pay the zakah in, it's 2.5%. Or whatever amount you have divided by 40. Simple. Sometimes the calculator, you know, we get confused now. Divide by 40%, mushkila, 25, 2.5%, mushkila. Jayid. You have to form up an accountant and ask them. All you need to do is just divide by 40 and you get your answer. You got a million, divide by 40, you got your answer. 10 million, divide by 40, you got your answer, inshallah. 40, dividing by 40 equals to, divide, equals to working out 2.5%. S is for the month of Shawwal, alhamdulillah. That's the month of fasting the six days. Jayin, we fast six days in Shawwal. It's equal to fasting the entire year. Jayin? Yes or no? Uh, Prophet or some stated that. Uh, what if I have qada? Do I have to make my qada first, then make my six? No, no, no. You can make your six first, and you have the whole year to make up your qada. Earlier you do it, the better, inshaAllah. Sins. S is also for sins, ya Abdullah. Allah Musta'ar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. Because many a times, ya Abdullah, ya Allah. You know, it might come in knowledge, you know, we're up to date. When it comes to our aqeedah, alhamdulillah, we're not our great worshippers, we're not doing anything wrong and this and that and all of those fancy things. Alhamdulillah, we're all fine. But it's sins that gets us down. Jayid, from morning till evening, we're watching haram, we're listening to haram, we're talking haram. We're talking about this person, that person. Suleiman, you heard what Ahmed did, you heard what Sumeya, Sumeya got divorced. This is what happened. I heard this story, you heard that story. And we go on and on and on. Allah Mustaan. Ghiba, G was for Ghiba also, Ya Abdullah. G was for Ghiba. And Ibn Hazm, we started talking about Ibn Hazm and we skipped the topic. Huh? What did we say about Ibn Hazm? Nothing. <laughs> Ibn Hazm, he said it was Sunnah to kiss your wife in Ramadan. Remember, we started speaking about Ibn Hazm, we went to Spain, then we went to India, we never came back. Huh? You guys forgot a lot of time. Ibn Hazm, he was a Zahiri scholar, literalist scholar. They didn't look at the meanings behind things. They just go with the literal. So he said, Prophet wasallam kissed his wife in Ramadan when he was fasting. Why, how, but I'm not interested. It is sunnah upon every person when they're fasting, they must kiss their wife. It's sunnah. And he took it to that level. Scholars were discussing, is it makru or not? Is it allowed or not? He said, it's sunnah. You must wipe off some did so. Uh, literal. Jayid. Ibn Hazm rahimahullah. Jayid. Also, Ibn Hazm with regards to the sin of ghibah. What does Allah say in the Quran? 
Do you like to eat the flesh of your brother? Ghiba, speaking bad about your brother. Allah called it eating the flesh of your brother. So he said, because he was literalist, he said, if you backbite someone while you're fasting, your fast is broken. Why? Because you ate. Allah said, he said but the scholar said, that's not eating. He says, who, who are you? Who are you? Allah said in the Quran that's eating. End of story. Who am I to debate? Understand where he came from? Subhanallah. So they were of the opinion, if you backbite someone, your fast is broken. Subhanallah. Allah is that. Jaid, you all know the famous hadith of uh, Ma'iz. Ma'iz radiallahu ta'ala, companion of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sahaba, were they ma'asum? Were they free from sin? No. They would fall into mistakes, etc. Jaid. Uh, the Anbiya, yes, they were ma'asum. As for the Sahaba, they made mistakes. Jaid. Ma'iz comes, Ya Rasulullah. I have made a mistake. What happened, Ya Ma'iz? He says, I've fallen into zina. Prophet ﷺ turned away from him. Ya Rasulullah, I've fallen into zina, turned away. Prophet said, Is he mad? You know, is he insane? You know, check up, you know, is he they said, No, he's sane, Ya Rasulullah. Smell his mouth. Maybe he's drunk, maybe he doesn't know what he's saying. He smelt his mouth, he's fine, he's okay. Hadith in Abu Dawood. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I have fallen into zina. Nobody saw. He could have kept it quiet. He could have sat in his house, made tawbah to Allah. End of story. But his consciousness was killing him. So he comes, Ya Rasulullah, I've fallen into the sin. I want purification. What's the purification? Stone to death. I want this. I want the punishment. Prophet Sallallahu asked him to testify four times and he made iqrar. He confessed four times that he's done so. In equal to four witnesses. He said to the Sahaba, take him and have him stoned. They took him along. While they were stoning him, he began running away. And he ran and they chased him, they caught him, they stoned him to death. And khalas. That was the end of Ma'iz. After that, some of the Sahaba, they said to one another, they said that, uh, look at Ma'iz. Allah covered up his sin. He came out in public and he publicized his sin. And now he died like how a dog dies. Look at what a disgraceful death. He was stoned to death. Huh? Prophet Wasallam overheard this. There was a dead camel lying somewhere, carcass smelling, stinking for a few days. Prophet said to both of them, go and eat of that carcass. He said, how can we eat of that? Smelling, smelling. Prophet said that your speaking bad about Ma'iz was worse than both of you eating from the dead carcass. Ma'iz right now, he's swimming in the rivers of paradise. SubhanAllah. Here's a Sahabi who lived in Medina al munawwara met with the Prophet وسلم, daily, sat in his majalis, in his, uh, in his gatherings. But desire got the better of him. He fell into sin. Nobody is masoom. Every one of the children of Adam, they make mistakes. He made a mistake. But that which distinguished them, which made them different from us, it would turn back to Allah and make tawbah. And so from the completion of his tawbah, he wanted this purification. You're talking bad about Ma'is. You know, is worse than whatever my Israel is right now in the rivers of paradise, subhanAllah. And that was the sin of the tongue, speaking bad about their brother, talking ill about him. You also know about the other female. Similarly, female, she was pregnant. She comes here, Rasulullah. You know, I've fallen into the sin. Do what was done upon Ma'is, meaning stone me to death. Prophet turned away from her. Why? He doesn't want people, you know, coming. We have a principle in the Sharia when you commit a sin. Uh, that's a sin. Don't come out in public and publicize it. Why? Because you desensitize the public by doing that. Jayid, you find, for example, on Facebook, Jayid, uh, there's someone has a profile, this famous uh, Chachima or something. Jayid, uh, famous. You have Nanima, which is good, and then you have Chachima or something. Subhanallah. If and sisters would know. Every single day, you know, there's something there. You know, I've fallen into this sin here, slept with the father-in-law, did something wrong there, give me some advice. I'm in love with this person, fell into zina, did that, give me some advice. This is publicizing of sin. This desensitizes the people. It makes it like, you know, now it's khalas, it's acceptable. You know? That day it's a sin on its own. Prophet says everyone would be forgiven except Al Muhaj Al Mujahirun. Mujahirun is the one who come out in public and they publicize their sins. But these companions, they came to the Prophet. Why? Not to publicize, but rather seeking purification. They were seeking the punishment. And so she says, Look, I'm pregnant, Ya Rasulullah. Don't turn away from me. I am pregnant. Prophet said to the Sahaba, take her and have a stone. No, said to her that uh, come back once you give birth. 
So she went home. Months later she comes. Was there any policeman standing outside the house, making sure she's going to come back? No, she could have skipped town, gone wherever, but she knows Allah is watching. There's a video I put up on Facebook. Facebook, we have an account there called Dean Class. This brother in Saudi Arabia, he's deaf. He's, you know, he's not deaf. He can't see. He's dumb. He can't speak. Uh, you know, he's never seen any human being from the time he was born. He's, he's blind. But his brother is saying that uh, one time, you know, he was doing some sort, some sin or something. He was uh, doing something that we told him not to eat, etc. He went into his room and he took the blanket, put the blanket over his head, and he's eating it under the blanket. Eventually, when we caught him, we asked him why. He says, "Oh, because Allah, Allah is watching. Allah is watching. Subhanallah." Man doesn't, you know, he doesn't, you know, he's not like us, doesn't have this intellect, but he knows his fitra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching, subhanahu wa So similarly, this female, she comes. That's why she remained. After she had given birth, Ya Rasulullah, look at the kid here. He says, no, take the kid and come back once the kid has stopped breastfeeding. Once the kid can survive on solids on its own. And then she came back many months later. But this is like over a year, etc. Prophet Sosam said to them, take her and have her stoned to death. They stoned her to death. Khalid ibn Walid, when he stoned, some blood came onto his face. And so he said a bad word about her. You know, what's a you know, immoral woman, etc. Something of the sort. Prophet Wasallam said to him, that this female here, she's made a tawbah. If her tawbah had to be distributed for 70 men of Medina and Munawwara, it would suffice all of them. Never ever judge a book by its cover. Never ever judge a book by its cover. Subhanallah. Uh, you find many a time someone who might look down upon look at this person. You never know. Maybe on your world, are we in a you know in a queue to Jahannam, and there's an opposite queue to paradise. And that person, you meet him on the way there, and he's going the opposite direction. Or maybe you in the queue to Jannah, inshallah, but that guy's five thousand people ahead of you, twenty billion people ahead of you. Subhanallah. We never ever know Allah Jayyid. So that was that was S for sins. Jayyid. S for sins. S also for suhoor. Alhamdulillah. Suhoor Prophet says even if it's a glass of water. Some people they don't wake up for suhoor. He says no I can manage. No. You should wake up for suhoor. It's the sunnah. Even if you have a glass of water have something. The angels also make dua for the people with the sahirin. The people who wake up for suhoor. Jayyid. Suhoor like uh, suhoor is the act of eating and sahur is you know uh, no. wudu, and wudu is the act and wudu is the water suhoor is the act of eating and sahur is whatever you eat t for taraweeh what does taraweeh mean what does taraweeh mean uh, ironically taraweeh means rest uh, taraweeh means to rest how ironic is that where did the rest come from this was not a word given by the Prophet uh, We mentioned previously, he only made taraweeh, if you want to call it taraweeh, for about three nights or two nights, Jayid. Later on in history, during the time of Umar and then Uthman, etc., you know, this term was coined. Taraweeh means rest. From what? Because after every four rakas, they used to have a rest. Maybe five minutes, ten minutes rest, etc. Because their taraweeh was long, maybe two hours, etc. So they would have a rest. So that salah was called salat al taraweeh due to the rest between the various four rakats. Jayid, hayyakum Allah. Jayid, we did five more minutes. Allah uh, Jayid, uh, we did once put up a video on uh, Dean Class's thing. This one Turkish Imam, subhanAllah. I mean, this guy, they call him Farari Imam. Farari Imam. Jayid, he guarantees you 20 rakats of salah in 15 minutes. I mean, you look at the video, it's, it, it is a workout. It's an aerobic workout, up down, right? You for underage, those who are not Bali, we spoke about that already. We said that as for zakah, zakah is due on the well, and so they should pay zakah. As for fasting, they don't have to fast. V, V is for very tasty. Inshallah, the iftar today will be very, very tasty. W, W is for waiting, and we wait, and we wait, we wait for iftar, inshallah. And we also wait to see our rewards. In the hereafter, we also wait for we wait for the day of Eid. I know when we were young, inshallah, we're still young. I've been 27 for the past few years now. Now, point is, uh, we wait for the day of Eid. You know, when we were young, etc. You know, we wait for Eid. So, how much did you get? How did you get? I noticed, I don't know whether it's my family or what, but this uh, Eid practice is like that. This is a good bid'ah. This Eid bid'ah is a good bid'ah. Keep it up, inshallah. Don't let it die, the kids. 
Now, and uh, x is for what's x for? I don't know what x is for. Shall I show it? Uh, I wrote here triple x. Jade, s x is for kiss, etc. We already discussed that. Y is for what is y for? Y is for? I don't have a word. You tell me. Why is for? Why do we fast? Because Allah obliged it upon us. Why? So that we might get this. This taqwa. What is taqwa? Umar's definition of taqwa was what? Huh? What was Umar's definition of taqwa? Jayyid. Mumtaz. Umar said the definition of taqwa is like a person who's walking a path and there's lots of crevices, there's some holes, there's some uh, branches, there's some thorns, etc. And the person is careful where he puts his feet. He doesn't want to tear his clothes, doesn't want to step into the water. So he's careful where he puts his feet. He says that's the definition of taqwa, in that you are careful with regards to every step that you take, whether you're entering into the haram, whether you're entering into the makro, etc. Taqwa is also a shield, because you put a shield of taqwa between you and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Z is for zakatable. What are my zakatable assets? All your currencies, all your cash on hand, all your shares, for example, Jayid, uh, your shares, your investments, etc., all of that is zakatable. Uh, your trading stock, also zakatable, whatever you trade in. Uh, let's say, for example, someone has a wholesale. You have selling price, you have, so you have a retail price, you have wholesale price, and you also have cost price. Which one do you use to calculate your zakat? Do you use cost price? Absolutely not. Never ever cost price. You could have bought something 10 years ago and its cost was 10 rand and you're paying zakat on 10 rand? No! Zakat is either the market value. Market value is either retail price or wholesale price. If you go with retail, alhamdulillah, you're paying more zakat. But if you go with the wholesale price, it's fine, inshallah. Some scholars say it depends on the type of business. If you're in retail business, work with retail price. If you're in wholesale business, then you work with the wholesale price. Even if you're in retail and you worked out on a wholesale price, someone walks in and says, I'll buy everything, you work out a price, no problem, inshallah. But never ever cost price. You could have bought something 50 years ago and it's not yet sold. You can't be using 50 years ago cost price. Jayid, what other assets are zakatable? So the person who has sheep, camels, etc. It's not for sale. He just keeps it like he's got thousand camels. He likes to look, likes to look at them. That's zakatable. But if he trades in camels, then it's like a person who trades in cameras. A person who trades in cars. It's is it's trading stock. Right? A uh, person uh, trades in gold jewelry. So there might be an issue with a female who wears gold, whether it's zakatable or not. But somebody who sells gold, that is zakatable because it's from the angle and the category of trading stock. Jayid. And that is Z. Alhamdulillah. Hayya Sorry? Questions. Yes, anyone has questions? Sisters, if they have questions, they can send it with more. Send it. So we'll get the question. We'll get five minutes left here. Uh, the question was the, with regards to can someone take zakat and collect zakat at the same time? Yes, 100%. I would think most people fall in that category because uh, it's a, let's see, with the current situation, most scholars in South Africa go with the Nisab of 3,000. And so they would say, we can't give zakat to people who have more than 3,000. Listen. South African context, right? they say that the definition between or the distinction between rich and poor is 3,000. If you got more than three, you rich, you pay zakat. You got less than three, you poor, you can take zakat. You with me? But is that really this you know situation on the ground? A person who's got five, is he rich? No. A person who earns six, are they rich? No. Right? So in reality, rich and poor is defined by the custom and the norms of the society. Right? So uh, if someone earns 3,000 or 4,000 a month. And let's say at the end of the year, they have stashed away 10,000. They, they got 10,000 or they got 7,000. They will pay zakat on that amount. They will pay zakat on that amount. Like our brother, we said he's got a job. He's a clerk somewhere. He earns seven a month. But he needs 12 for his monthly usage, etc. So over the year, he needs what? 50,000, 60,000. He needs 60,000 of zakat. We give him 60,000 of zakat. And if he kept away, you know, some money, some savings or something he puts in somewhere, he'll pay zakat on his savings and we also give him zakat. No problem with that. In fact, most people will fall in that category. And if we say that the criteria is only three, then maybe most poor won't even fall in that category. 
Okay? Most poor, we are really be looking for the super, super, super poor. Maybe in South Africa you won't even find people like that. We read. Okay? Any questions? Any questions you have shared? Now. When you're calculating your zakat, yes. right? say for example a house, yeah. you don't add it to your asset base. Yeah. But you add the debt. Yeah. You subtract the debt. Yes. What's the reason you need? Because that's something that you need. A house is a fundamental uh, hack for every single person. So shouldn't it be that you don't add the asset and you don't add the debt? No. You don't add the asset. The house. So shouldn't your you house. Add you don't have the asset. You don't have it. And then shouldn't you also not take off the liability? No, because uh, I mean, you owe that money. It's a debt. You owe the money. Why should you not minus it? Why should I? Why should I not minus it? Why? Tell me why. Because I think it's. it's I don't unfair. owe that money. I owe that money. That money there belongs to someone else. I don't own it. I think it's unfair. Doesn't it? No. Zakat right. is taking from the rich and giving to the poor. I think it's the unfair. person who doesn't have enough of money to have a house. Fall in the category no, of rich. It's unfair to the poor because Why? you're adding the liability, you're taking off the liability, yeah. but you're not adding the asset. Because, and similarly with that poor person, if he wants to buy a house, etc., and he owes some money, he won't be adding it to it. Because a house, a car, I mean, these are the you know the primary matters for you to reach the level of being rich. The guy is from the rich to the poor. You don't even have a house, you're not really rich. On investment property, yeah. Do you have to pay what do you mean by investment property? I own a house. Let's see. Let, let's take with what is clear. Somebody who's got a property and he's rented it out. He pays the cap on the rent income, not on the value of the property. Somebody who's got properties and he gets rent income, he does not pay the cap on the value of the property, but he pays the cap on the rent income. That's clear. Next person, person who sells properties. He pays zakat on the market value of that property. Just like somebody who's selling suitcases, he pays zakat because that's trading stock. So that's clear. Third person. The person who uh, has purchased a property, but not with the intention of selling it, and not with the intention of staying in it. Just purchased it, you know, maybe one day, you know, I'll do something with it. Maybe one day I'll save, maybe one day I'll sell it. Maybe one day I'll just keep my money safe. Yeah. Does he pay zakat on that? No, he doesn't pay zakat. Similarly with the person who's got 20 diamonds in his pocket. No zakat on that. Right? So it's not all assets that are zakat. Right? I mean, a person could have some massive assets. I mean, that's why Mulana is by diamonds. Right? No zakat. Right? Now, they say that diamonds are a... Are what? Diamonds are a... You guys don't know. And you guys are in Santa. Diamonds are a... Diamonds are... A diamond is a woman's best friend. Jayin? What's the male's best friend? They say a dog. A dog is a man's best friend. Each one to their own aspiration. And these females have higher aspirations. A long time. Jayin. Anything else? I'm trying. How many minutes left? Before you start. Are you still recording? You said something earlier. Yeah, father. When you get to oh, you explain about it. You did it. What's something the fast being hard? Ah, the fast was hard in the early days. In the early days, the month of Ramadan, it was up to you. If you want to fast, fast. If you don't want to fast, don't fast. If you fast, alhamdulillah. If you don't fast, you feed a poor person for every day. If you are Umar, nice and healthy, you don't have to fast. In the early days, this is how it was. Super easy. Not an obligation. Then it was made an obligation and it was super difficult. From super easy went to super difficult. Why? There was no such thing as suhoor. There was no suhoor. You made iftar in the evening. If you made isha or you fell asleep, there's no eating again. You woke up at 9 o'clock at night, you can't eat. You can't sleep with your wife. Midnight, mafi sleeping with your wife, you can't eat. You wait until the next evening. So iftar time, after iftar, you can be with your wife, uh, you, you can be for Isha, all of those things. But after you sleep, etc., khalas, it's all over. One companion, he was working hard the whole day, came home, wife is wait, making, wait, waiting for the food, he's waiting for the food, he fell asleep. Khalas can't eat, so he fasted like two days uh, without eating food, and he collapsed the next day. That's when Allah sent down the revelation that uh, now you fast from true dawn until sunset. The night is totally permissible for you to do what you want, right? 
So that's the Ramadan, and that's the manner that we have today, alhamdulillah. Super hard, easy, to super difficult, to the middle that we know, inshallah. Jay, anything else on chat? How many minutes left? Ten. Ten, okay. Let's go. Happy Christmas. Hayyakum.